Welcome back everybody, this is Eric here with IRAC Veteran 8888. Today we've got a very special video for you. I know we've got a ton of new gun owners out there and I'm sure a lot of you are really confused about what your first carry gun should be. So I wanted to put together a special presentation to go over a few different thought processes that you should really kind of have going through your minds here as to what you might want to pick. And I'll give you a little bit of my experience on it. Um, maybe might save some of you a little bit of headache uh, when you're searching for guns. I mean, there's a lot of stuff out there, a ton of different options, and I know for the new gun buyer, it can be really hard to kind of dial in uh, what would be the perfect thing for you. And I know there's a ton of information out there. It's almost information overload, right? Uh, when you're looking at all the stuff that's out there for information, you're trying to consume all this stuff, and you're like, heck, well, this guy thinks this, this guy thinks that, and you're just as confused after you've watched all the content as you were when you went into the content. And believe me, I get it. Uh, it's nice to have options, but sometimes you want to narrow it that window down a little bit. So uh, we are going to go over that here. I used to work at a gun store uh, some years back, Moss Pond and Gun, really good people. Um, I haven't been behind the counter in quite a while, but I wanted the spirit of this video to be very much in the vein of being back at Moss and being behind the gun counter and being at the point of sale selling guns. Uh, just like I used to uh, in the old days. But I want the spirit of this video to be very much in that vein. So we will go over some options. I would like to take a moment to thank our friends at Firearms Legal Protection. If you are ever involved in a legal, justified self-defense situation, it can be a really scary type of situation to be involved in, right? You're worried if you did the right thing. You know, you don't know what's going to happen legally. Uh, so the guys at FLP, you know, when you enlist their services, if you are involved in a shooting, uh, they will have their lawyers at your side to make sure that you are, you know, getting taken care of and getting the representation you need. Make sure you check them out. If you do decide to go with their services, use the code IV8888 and you'll get yourself a bit of a discount and tell them we sent you over there. Firearms Legal Protection, FLP. And uh, that's very relevant to this video, obviously, because we are talking about picking out a carry gun. And with carrying a firearm... You know, also comes a lot of responsibilities, right? Um, you know, a firearm is a dangerous object, and we want to make sure we're treating it with the utmost uh, amount of care. Um, now, this video could go down a, a multitude of rabbit holes, and I'm not going to do that uh, to you just yet. Uh, we're going to try to keep it real basic. I do have a couple of different holster options I'm going to show you. We'll talk briefly about ammunition and different cartridges, but for the most part, we're really going to talk about um, different gun designs, right? Because the way that the actions work on various pistols and the style that, you know, they're meant to be carried in or the condition that they're meant to be carried in, uh, it, it does kind of drastically change a little bit as you get into some different technologies. Um, also, an important thing to consider is that not all pistols are super easy to pull back the slide on. So if you're a person that doesn't have like you know, a lot of upper body strength or maybe your hand strength isn't as strong, maybe you're an elderly person and you have arthritis and it can be really hard to grip something tight, like you might have a hard time opening a pickle jar, much less gri uh, gripping a slide on a pistol and pulling it back. So believe it or not, there are options for you know every single person. There is absolutely no reason for it anyone to not have a firearm to protect themselves and uh, firearm is a very useful tool in that regard. So um, what a lot of people tend to get confused about is you know they hear all this conjecture about different carry rounds and things like that, different action types, you know maybe perhaps um, a name gets thrown out there. They may hear oh well this guy bought a Glock or this guy bought a Beretta or a CZ or whatever and they hear this name and they start to associate you know the name of the gun right so it's easy to kind of have that brand rec recognition start coming into play because you hear um, you know different guns get talked about uh, let's just say um, in popular culture maybe you saw a really cool gun in a movie and you're like oh I think I might want to own one of those and that's normal right like it's awesome to see John Wick running around with the fancy Turan tactical customized shotguns and pistols and things like that and uh, there certainly is um, some truth to that, right? You know, having a very well-tuned and well-set-up carry gun can go a long way in increasing your survivability in, let's just say, a defensive situation. But let's face it, like, most of us aren't John Wick. Um, even Keanu Reeves isn't John Wick, I guess, technically. I mean, he had to do a lot of training for that movie uh, to get as proficient as he, as he did. 
the truth is most of us are going to be going to the post office to check our P.O. box or something, or going to the grocery store, or going to the bank, or we're picking up our kids from school, we're doing whatever, right? We're going throughout our life and we're just normal people doing normal things, uh, but we just happen to choose to be armed to protect ourselves. I mean, think about a gun like a life insurance policy, right? Um, it's completely normal uh, to go, wow, you know, guns are scary. Uh, I, you know, I'm going to treat this with respect. And there are a lot of different people out there in terms of how they look at how they treat guns, right? Some folks are raised around them and some folks know to be very careful. And, and some folks need a little bit more, uh, you know, reinforcement and a little bit more training and a little bit more knowledge about what they're dealing with. So just like any tool, right? I can hurt myself with an axe or with a, with, with a hammer. I can hurt myself if I step the wrong way out of my truck and fall out of that three feet tall sucker. And, you know, so there's lots of ways we can hurt ourselves. So once we understand that a firearm is just a tool, we can start to approach it from that aspect of going, all right, well, in, in everyday carry and carrying a gun and using a gun for self-defense, what is going to be the tool that is best going to serve me? And there's a lot of different options. So I think the way that we can kind of start this out is, and I'm assuming that someone watching this video is a layman that is you know, not into guns. Maybe you just have a passing interest in firearms and you want to learn a little bit and you want to kind of figure out, okay, well, what is everybody carrying, right? I guess that's what most of us do, right? We have this confirmation bias uh, and it's a very natural human trait, right? What do we do? Okay, if we want to get into something, say I want to get into skiing, what do we do? We read articles, we go online, we consume information, and we go, all right, well, what are, what are the pros using? What are, what's the average person using in terms of equipment, right? What kind of training does the average person get to learn how to ski? You're not just going to haphazardly put on a set of skis and go just launching down the slope haphazardly towards a, a, a pine tree, right? So, you know, we, we approach everything with discipline, care, and there's that confirmation bias that goes in there. So what I want to lay out here is I'm going to tell you what I use. I'm going to explain why I use it. And we're going to explain some different action types. So when you do go to pick out a gun, you'll have a little bit better idea of what you're looking at. Now, you can't really talk about gun technology unless you talk about the cartridges that they're chambered in. So if you're new, I'm just going to give you super basically, you do realize, and I want you to realize, that these uh, firearms, they can be chambered in a variety of different cartridges. And the real layman's terms, super basic thing you need to know is that, you know, there is no such thing as a free lunch in physics, right? So, you know, if you start getting a big heavy caliber that shoots, you know, large projectiles at fast velocities, I mean, sure, you're, you're going to start getting some more recoil. Uh, the gun's going to require a little bit more mastery. Obviously, if the gun is chambered in a smaller cartridge, it's going to generate less recoil, generally, which we're going to talk about some design parameters you need to think about. Uh, so that's the way you can sort of approach it, right? If you're new to guns, you probably don't need to go buy some big, crazy Magnum revolver or a 50 cal Desert Eagle or a 44 Magnum or something like that. And honestly, you probably don't need to go buy a 45 ACP because 45s can have a little bit of a snappy recoil. 40s can have a little bit of snappy recoil. I love the 40 bores. I love 45s, which we are going to show some of those off. So let's talk a little bit just basically about technology in terms of, you know, we could go down the rabbit hole of how this stuff got here and, and the technology that went into what we see here on the table. But in the modern world, walking into a gun store and saying, hey, gun salesman. I want to get a gun to protect myself. This is a pretty solid like variety here that you're going to see in your average gun shop. And this stuff represents um, pretty relatively um, the apex of pistol technology that we have available to us. I mean, now granted, getting into some of the fancy race guns, uh, just know that these guns can be highly customized and tricked out with red dots and counterweights and fancy sights and trigger jobs and springs and action you know action jobs and all of this type of stuff. So just understand that we're we're going with the basic daily driver here. We're not getting into the super fancy stuff. Although I do have a few guns here that are pretty cool. So without that without going any further, um, let's just kind of work our way around a little bit. Now um, I'm gonna pull out a J-frame revolver 
Now, a revolver, in terms of the characteristic of a what we call a wheel gun or a revolver, this is a Smith & Wesson Wiley Clap uh, J-frame. This is a 38, and uh, I carry this gun religiously quite a bit uh, in relatively deep concealment, and this, this is a nice flat gun that, that hides quite well. Uh, initially, one, one detractor from a revolver, capacity. All right, it is a wheel gun, so this only holds five shots. So this is probably not a gun for a beginner. Uh, that's not to say that, you know, someone's first firearm that they ever buy, that it's not a revolver. Some people buy a wheel gun for their first, uh, you know, firearm purchase. Uh, you can certainly do that if you want. I would not recommend a wheel gun for a first-time gun owner, especially if you're going to carry it for self-defense, because there are quite a few of very, very <laughs> exacting intricacies you have to keep in mind when you are manipulating a wheel gun, especially if you're trying to reload one of these things under this rigors and stress of, uh, let's just say, someone shooting back, okay? Now, uh, it does take a very specialized amount of training and time and care and discipline to be deadly with a revolver in terms of being able to load and manipulate and work the gun in a fast, a fast and dynamic environment such as that of a personal defense situation. All right. Now that's not to say that this won't serve you. They will, uh, but I probably would not recommend this as a first-time gun. Now I, I love wheel guns. I love J-frame revolvers. They are fantastic. This is a great gun. Okay. So I don't want you thinking it's not a uh, worthy type of setup. This is a Galco holster. So I wanted to show the holster that I use in this as well. Um, this is a leather holster made by Galco, and it's just a belt loop holster. And if you're wearing a good rigid gun belt, this thing conceals pretty deep. So if you just run into the store or something, you pop your shirt, uh, you know, it's a very easy gun to hide. But just understand that as a wheel gun, um, it is going to be a little bit different. Uh, all right, and here I've got a Model 67-5 carry comp. So this is another revolver from Smith & Wesson. And this particular one um, is really, it is set up for carry. It has the front night sight. It's compensated. Uh, this one's in 38 uh, special as well. This one is a six shot because we're stepping up in our frame size. And of course, this one has the non-glare coatings and stuff. So very impervious to rust and the elements. And uh, arguably, I mean, one of the smoothest actions on a revolver you could ever feel. I mean, a really nice double action on this gun. And uh, the 67-5, this is a cool gun. Now, is this a good first-time gun? Probably not. You know, this is for more of an experienced gun handler, okay? But I wanted to, you know, make sure you understood what revolvers were uh, because that is one of the action types that you need to be familiar with. So you have revolvers. And then we get into auto-loading pistols, semi-automatics, okay? So you're going to have to kind of bear with me a bit here. So I'm assuming you're new. This is meant to be a 101 type of thing for picking out your, your favorite gun. Um, I'm just going to lay out some super basic traits about these guns so you can understand what we're dealing with. All right, so I'm going to reach over here. Here's another Smith. All right, this is, the, this is a Scandium Frame 1911 from Smith & Wesson. Uh, this is a very, very nice pistol. Um, you probably, if you've watched any amount of movies or if you've engaged in any type of popular culture related to video games, you've probably seen a 1911. It's probably one of the most iconic and familiar gun designs ever, right? A lot of people know the shape of this gun. Now, granted, this is a little more modern. You can see the, uh, you know, the sort of bobtail on the frame back here. And this one has some really wicked looking serrations here on the slide. So this is a very modern 1911, but the basic shape and functionality is pretty similar to the way they've always been. I mean, we're talking a gun that's been around since World War I. Okay, this gun's 100 years old, the basic design parameters of this gun. Uh, now it's gone through some changes, but what I'll just basically tell you here is this is what's called a single action pistol. Okay, this is the magazine. All right, so the idea behind the semi-auto, you noticed on the revolver, okay, we place our rounds individually into these chambers in the cylinder. Okay, this is the cylinder, all right, and each one serves as its own chamber, and you place the rounds in there, okay? And what happens when you fire a revolver is the cylinder rotates, okay? See how that cylinder rotates when I manipulate the, the revolver? Now, when all the shots are in, you're out of shots, you have to 
open this back up, eject the spent shells with the ejector rod, and then you've got to either use a speed loader, which in a combat situation, you will run speed loaders. Now you can already see where it's, it's getting a little more difficult, right, you know, in terms of manipulating, but you have to understand that's a drastic difference. Now on the wheel gun, that's how you have to work that. On a semi-auto, you have generally, now everything we're going to show here works essentially in this same basic way. You have a magazine, all right? The rounds are loaded into the magazine. The magazine is inserted into the pistol, okay? And then when you cycle the slide, it loads around into the chamber, okay? You notice the hammer is to the rear. So if this had a live round in it, it would be ready to shoot. So when I shoot, all right, the hammer drops, bang, the gun goes off, okay? And in that process, now it's a little more complicated than this, but I'm just going to give you the super basic version, the, the PG super low-end 101 version, all right? The for recoil forces of the gun exert rearward and kick the spent shell out. The slide falls, strips another round off of the magazine, and the cycle repeats. So in semi-automatic, that's what we're referring to. The gun loads itself. It is self-loading. Until the supply of ammunition in the magazine has been depleted. Okay, so this is a seven-shot mag. So you get one in the chamber, and, and seven makes eight rounds of 45 ACP what we call a single stack magazine. It means that the, that the rounds stack in one single column. They don't stagger. Uh, so that limits you on the capacity, but since the 1911 uses a 45 ACP, it's a pretty big cartridge, to keep the size of the gun slim and to make it easy to hide and easy to conceal and make it feel you know right in the hand and not have some big crazy grip on it, uh, most 1911s are going to be in a single stack configuration just to keep that size uh, down a little bit. So this is what we call a single action only pistol. Single action. All right, the hammer falls, it shoots the gun, that's it. All right, now let me explain. Here's a, here's a Browning 380 black label. So I left this gun out just to put in perspective for you. This is the same basic type of gun design, but in 380 automatic. Notice the size difference, okay? It's a much smaller gun, okay? So it's gonna operate the same as its, as its big brother over there, but it's chambered in a much smaller cartridge. So that puts that into perspective for you, but both of these pistols are single action, all right? You have manual safety. Now I know you've probably heard people say, oh, I'm gonna carry cocked and locked. Well, that's what they mean. On a single action, the hammer's cocked, the safety is locked, right? It's cocked and locked. To use the pistol, you pull it out of the holster, you remove the safety, you squeeze the trigger, okay? That's a single action. That's the most basic type of operating mechanism for a pistol, and arguably, we would say, one of the oldest style um, of pistols, right, is just a basic single action, a hammer that falls, sets the cartridge off, all right? Um, and I wanted to also just show off this holster, all right. Um, our buddy Drew at uh, Quick Custom Carry Holsters, he makes these holsters, and uh, it's just a G-code paddle, and that's made for a 1911. So if you're wearing uh, a belt, you can slip this down in your pants, and it'll clip behind your belt, and you wear it on the outside of the belt. So I wanted to show uh, that style of holster. That's a paddle holster. Super basic. We're not going to go into a lot of detail on holsters. But I just want to show you a few of the different holster options that are out there, okay? So that's pretty basic. And then, then we get into a double single action. Okay, so I'm going to explain that. Um, this is a CZ SP01 Phantom. All right, so here we're getting into the Czechoslovakian uh, variety. Okay, we're going away from USA and getting into, into the Czechs here. And uh, the CZ75 is a gun that you definitely need to know about. Uh, it is a fantastic pistol, and variants of this gun are awesome. Uh, the SP01 is a polymer frame gun. Uh, CZs, like the 75, are traditionally known for being metal frame guns. Uh, the older school CZs are all metal, and they're super, super great guns. I mean, I just, I love these pistols so much. But I'm a big fan of the SP01 Phantom, and this is a polymer frame gun, and it's great, right? Now, 
the setup of this is going to be a little bit different. So you still have the single action that you had in the 1911 variant that we showed you. Right? When the slide is withdrawn, the hammer is to the rear and it's in a single action mode. If I squeeze the trigger, bang, I get around, and as long as there's ammo in the magazine and there's a magazine inserted, the gun reciprocates, throws a spent shell out, strips a new one in, and I still have a single action mode. When I release the trigger, all right, it resets and you keep shooting until the, the supply of ammo in the magazine's empty. The difference is you have double single action. So with a double action, you get almost a, a mix of the revolver trigger and the 1911 trigger because if the hammer is down and in a half cock position, I can carry this gun with the hammer down, pull it out of the holster, acquire my sight picture, all right, and I can squeeze the trigger gently. And look, as I squeeze the trigger, the hammer cocks itself and then fires. Once I'm all the way to the rear, it goes through a fire, fire cycle. If we look at the revolver trigger, okay, same thing. I have a single action on my revolver, or I have a double action. If the hammer's down and I want to carry it like this, that's fine. When I pull it out of the holster and I squeeze the trigger, it cocks the hammer, rotates the cylinder, and the round fires. So a revolver is double single action, okay? It just operates a little differently. Instead of using the magazine, it has the cylinder that rotates. Just different, that's all. The revolvers generally have less capacity. Now, to put that in perspective for you, the 1911 is like an eight shot. Uh, this is a nine millimeter. Um, this particular gun uses 19 shot magazines. So you can quickly see that now, granted, this is a full size polymer frame duty pistol with a light. All right, this is, this is ready to rock, okay? This, this is ready to trudge around the mountains of Afghanistan. Now, there actually is a funny story about that, but I'm not going to go through that in this particular video, okay? But this particular gun is fantastic. I like it. So you get to see that now we get into a double stack magazine, okay? So this particular style of magazine is a double stack. So when these rounds load into this magazine, they actually stagger in a column. So when they come up to the top of the magazine, they're only, they're only a single stack, but they stagger as they go down the body of the magazine, so that allows this mag to hold 17, 19 shots. Um, now, they make an extended base plate for this gun that has the 19 shot. This one's a 17 shot mag. So to put that in perspective for you, you get a lot more mag uh, ammo capacity when you get into something like a semi-auto and 9mm versus a wheel gun that might have five or six shots or versus a 1911, regardless of the chambering, that might only have an eight shot mag. So does that make sense? But the trade-off, okay, and we're getting into this, we're getting into the, the compromises that we have to make. The trade-off is, look, how, look at the thickness, okay? So a CZ-75, whereby this is an amazing gun and I would totally trust my life to it in a, in a heartbeat, we notice too, this is a much harder gun to hide and conceal. This is a full-size duty gun. Notice the size of this. I mean, that's, there's a lot going on right there versus this little slim 1911. Now, granted, you know, this Browning holds a lot less rounds, but look how concealable it is. So it all comes down to the trade-off that you're willing to uh, deal with, right? The trade-off is the smaller the gun and the single stack variety, the less rounds it holds, but the easier it is to hide. The larger the gun, the more it might hold and the more firepower and accessory compatibility that you might get. But look at, look at what you're trying to hide. This is a big gun. Now, are there any compromises that are somewhere in between those two things? Yes, there are. Okay. One way that we would go down the rabbit hole is something like a really small, what we call a mouse gun. This is a Beretta 950 and this one's in 25 ACP. Now, some would say, okay, now we're going down the rabbit hole of we take this 380, and this is a pretty slim 1911. This is a small gun, right? But we can actually make this concept even smaller by having a single stack 25, and we got this little bitty guy. Now, would this be a good first gun for somebody? Definitely not. This, this is a gun that is sort of a holdout, last ditch, close range. You know, maybe your main gun went down and you reach for this one because it's the only thing you got. I mean, I like 25s but I would not consider this the end-all, do-all self-defense gun. But I'm, I'm showing you where the compromises are, where the, you know, yeah, you can get super small 
and you get into a smaller cartridge, a smaller gun, and sure, it doesn't kick very hard, but the 25, many would say, is relatively anemic for self-defensive purposes. So I wanted to show an example of the trade-off. Now, have I carried this gun before? Yes, I have. Uh, I love this little gun. I can shoot it well. I'm very accurate with it, especially inside of like 10 feet, 12 feet. I can sit there and just drill those tar targets exactly where I want the round to go. It's not that this gun isn't capable, but it does require a good bit of discipline and care to carry this and actually feel like you're armed. Just my thought process, okay? Now what's another way we might can compromise just a little bit, okay? This here is my Smith & Wesson Shield. Um, this one's been highly customized by the folks at Robar, who unfortunately are no longer in business. Um, I know the young lady that does all the high power work over there on the Browning High Powers. Uh, she has her own company now, uh, and they do amazing work. But this particular one's been customized a bit. However, the basic function of this gun, the shield, is a really, really popular gun. Reason being is because this is a very slim pistol. So you get into the slim nature of a 1911, but here we have a polymer frame. It's chambered in 9mm. It holds a similar amount of rounds to a 1911, um, but you get a striker fire mechanism with a really crisp trigger. No safety, well, it does have manual safety, although you can get this gun in a non-manual safety version. Uh, but there's no external hammers and bull crap to get caught or messed up. Um, this is a striker fire pistol with a polymer frame. So see, now you're getting into a slightly different Goldilocks kind of zone because you've got the single stack nature of the 1911, but with some modern enhancements of a polymer frame gun. That keeps the overall size of the gun nice and slim. It's very slim and easy to carry. It's got a good trigger. It's got good sights. It's lightweight, so it doesn't, you know, it's not real cumbersome and difficult to tote around. So, and a cool thing about these pistols is this is an early shield. There are actually a ton of different shields that they've done over the years, like the Shield Plus, so they do make a double stack version of this gun now. Also, they have their EZ shield, which has a much easier slide to pull back. So that's something to consider. This gun is nice and slim, and this is a great carry gun for somebody that just wants deep concealment and EDC. But that slide, it is a little bit hard to pull back because it's a pretty stiff mainspring on this gun, okay? The recoil spring, you've got to overcome that to get that slide to the rear. And that may not be achievable for some folks, depending on their upper body strength, their hand strength, maybe you got arthritis, like we said before. And again, uh, we're showing off a different variety of holster. Um, this is the Black Diamond Guns and Gear Fat Boy holster. And this is a inside the waistband holster. So this is intended to be worn inside your waistband up front right here, okay? And this is a, arguably the deepest concealment uh, there is in terms of hiding a gun is an inside the waistband holster. Now there's a lot of different options out there, but this is just one to show you. You got inside the waistband, outside the waistband with a paddle, a belt loop holster that, that you as a leather holster, which is a little more traditional style of holster. All right. And just know that you can get this gun in a double stack, single stack, and the EZ model, which we'll be showing you a shot of that. So on the EZ, uh, it's a single stack, but the slide is super easy to work back. That's why they call it the EZ model. Uh, so they sort of addressed the fact that some of their autos were a little bit difficult to pull back, and by making the EZ, uh, they do have a model that is a little bit easier to pull back for folks that might lack a little bit of that hand strength. So just know that, you know, that's out there, all right? Okay, I'm going to go here and talk about probably my favorite carry gun. Now, uh, look, uh, this is a P365 from Six Hour, and these guns are fantastic, okay? There's been a lot of changes and a lot of advancements in carry guns over the years, and I think this is one of the most distinctive advancements that have come out in recent years because it's such a slim gun. So it's very, very slim, and it's very easy to conceal. So, look, if you compare the size of this P365 to the size of this Browning 380. Look, look how similar they are. I mean, the width is almost the same. 
And in fact, in some dimensions, the P365 is actually smaller than this gun. Now, bear in mind, this gun holds eight shots and it's a single stack, okay? And there's nothing wrong with that. The P365 utilizes a double stack mag and I actually get 15 shots in this gun and one in the chamber. I can get 16 rounds in my hand in a very, very, very compact setup. Uh, now, SIG makes a few different versions of this particular carry gun. Uh, this is the XL model, which has a longer sight radius, a little bit more grip space, a slightly different trigger. Um, they do make a smaller version of this gun if you, if you want a little bit shorter slide and a little bit more concealability. Um, that gun holds 12 shots. So I prefer to carry the XL because I get that additional uh, magazine capacity, which is great. The size of this gun is very slim. Um, when you look at guns like the Glock 19, which I love Glock 19s, that's one of my favorite carry guns. I really enjoy that pistol. But this gun is a game changer because you get that double stack capacity, but in a really slim and small gun that would pretty much be indicative of a single stack 1911. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Now, I didn't really discuss before the striker fire mechanism. Now, uh, you know, Glock came out with their striker fired, you know, Glock pistol around 1980 or so. I want to think the P80 came out around 1980. And ever since, um, a lot of companies have built striker fired guns. And uh, you notice there's no hammer back here. Or more specifically, let me grab this Smith. Okay, this is a Smith & Wesson M&P. You notice there's no hammer back here, all right? But there is a mechanism. Well, how does it work, right? So this uses a striker mechanism. So when the trigger is squeezed, it actually pushes a safety block up and puts a little bit of rearward pressure on the striker. The striker falls. It's obviously loaded by spring. The spring compresses and the striker launches down the channel, and this is very lame in terms. I'm not trying to be super specific here. I'm trying to tell you basically how it works. The striker falls through the channel and sets off the cartridge, okay? And that wasn't a thing until, you know, around 1980. So you gotta think, prior to that, every single gun that you ended up seeing uh, in some way, shape, or form in the main, main stream was either a double single action, single action, that was pretty much what you had right? Ruger P89s, you had all different, I mean, there's tons of guns out there that use that type of basic operating mechanism, and that's fine. But the striker fire pistol really did change things a lot. Well, why would you want a striker fire pistol over a hammer fire pistol? I mean, I'm not trying to convince you to buy a striker fire pistol. We're trying to lay out, okay, well, why would this be any better? Well, for one, there's a lot less that can go wrong in terms of, you know, all right, if this hammer is to the rear, all right, and I've got the safety on, all right, look at this, look at this giant space right here, all right? You can get dust bunnies, dirt, all kind of crap in there. So, you know, you do have some additional spaces where dirt and debris and nasty crap and sweat. I mean, when you carry a gun, it ain't going to stay pristine forever. It's going to get little bits of wear and rust and little spots on it. You're going to get dust bunnies in it and scratches and all kind of stuff. And that's just, that's natural, right? A lot of us sweat, and that sweat can get down in the little cracks and crevices. There's just a lot more places for fluids and dirt and nasty crap to get in this type of a gun, right? Um, so it's not saying that it's a bad design or it's not a good gun. It's just that's one of the inherent weaknesses uh, of this type of a gun design. When you have a hammer, you've got all this crap that can get down in there. On a striker fire gun, this channel inside of the slide is all enclosed in there. So unless uh, you would have to really get this thing in some gnarly conditions to get that striker channel filled with some gunk and make and deadline this gun to where it wouldn't work, right? So it just makes the gun a lot more streamlined. There's not a lot of crap to catch on your clothes when you're drawing the gun. Think about it like this. All right, say I'm drawing a 1911 from concealment. Okay, and that hammer's to the rear. I've got this beaver tail right here. I've got the hammer. I've got the safety. I mean, there, there's a lot going on. I mean, it's not to say that a 1911 hasn't been a great gun that has served a lot of folks in, in not only military, but a concealed carry fashion, just like this gun has. This is great. 
But that's just one thing to consider, right? You know, there's more crap to catch on your clothes, more dust and debris can make its way down into the action. Uh, and many would argue, and I would say, many would argue correct, that the striker fire definitely alleviates a lot of those, you know, sort of quirks that the double single action pistol's been sort of guilty of. Uh, now, remember earlier I said that this CZ is one of my favorite guns, and it is, and it's a double single action. I love it. Uh, they're arguably just amazing guns, right? So, um, companies still make double single action guns, so don't think that it's some like obsolete or, or wrong type of thing to buy. You know, if you shoot one and you really like it, then carry it, you know, just get what makes you happy and don't worry about it. I'm just saying that uh, in terms of a everyday carry duty, um, you know, something that can handle a little bit more abuse and getting dropped around and, and the elements and sweat and dirt and all that crap that happens when you carry a gun, uh, most people, I think, would probably consider a striker fire gun to be a little bit more well suited to the task of a gun being, uh, as a mechanism, being more of a duty ready type of arrangement. So this is an m and um, This one is a 45 ACP. All right. So this is a double stack 45 ACP. All right. So with the 1911, you've got a single stack mag. This is a double stack mag. Oh, it holds more rounds, but the trade-off, it's also a fatter grip. All right. So it's a little bit more to hold on to. So if you've got smaller hands, it might not be a super comfortable gun for you to handle. So I wanted to have that gun out to show you. Um, I would say overall, the gun that I always gravitate to, if I'm just going to go out and about um, in, in, in large, in public, just in my everyday um, business, the 365 is certainly a gun that I, um, that I like a lot. And, and here's the thing, whether it's a Shield Plus, there's a bunch of other guns out there that, that utilize this same basic type of functionality, being, let's say, a very small slim, thin pistol with a double stack magazine. That's a fairly new thing. The 365 was really like the first gun that did that. And a lot of the other companies started making a ton of different guns to sort of compete with the 365. Because in the gun world, if you're new to guns, which if you're watching this video, I'm assuming you're, you're new to this, you should know that it's very competitive, right? And when a company comes out with something really cool and cutting edge, the other companies have to do something very similar because, you know, they're going to lose a bunch of sales because everybody wants a new hotness. And that's, quite frankly, that's just how it works, right? I mean, we're, we all naturally do that, right? Like, if, if the Joneses have some cool new gun, we want to keep up with the Joneses. So that's how a lot of the market has responded to this particular pistol. And uh, I do like the 365. You know, it's a fantastic gun. It's got a great trigger. It's very easy to shoot. It's got good sights. Um, it also has a slide rider cut on this. So if you want to run a little red dot on here, you can do that. That's a real popular thing with pistols right now. Lots of folks want to run a red dot on there. And you can certainly do that. Um, now, that gives you some options for technology. I didn't want to discuss cartridges a lot. The reason being is because I'm going to do an entire presentation just on cartridges, okay? I wanted to talk about just gun actions to give you an idea. Um, also, here's another belt loop holster. This one's Kydex, okay? And this is an additional SP01 Phantom. Uh, this is a CZ75 with a polymer frame, and you can see uh, this is Kydex, which is like a hardened kind of plastic uh, you heat it up and it gets real soft and they can mold, you know, mold it real easy when it's soft and when it sets up, it's, it's real hard. Uh, almost think like a, um, almost like a really, really thick milk jug. All right. You know how a milk jug is kind of a hard plastic. It's formed. Uh, imagine that, but thicker, more heavy duty. All right. So that's, that's Kydex is what they call that. That's a Kydex belt loop holster for the 75. I wanted to show that holster off as well. All right, I'm going to end on one very distinctive and important note. All right, this is a Smith & Wesson m and 22 compact, okay? And this is, a, this is a 22 long rifle pistol. All right, the magazine, it's a 10-shot mag, holds 10 shots. And this one is outfitted with a KG made swarm. All right, and th so this is a suppressor. Without getting down the rabbit hole on suppressor ownership and NFA, don't worry about that right now. Just understand that as a first-time gun owner, if you 
are serious about learning how to shoot a pistol really well and, and really honing your skills and, and working on those fundamentals, I'd almost recommend, if you're not in a hurry, to buy a 22 first. Pick yourself up a 22 rimfire pistol, okay? Pick up a couple of thousand rounds of ammo, which the nice thing about 22 is it doesn't cost a lot of money, and spend some time shooting that gun. They don't kick hard. They are a little loud. You know, if you're going to shoot them without a suppressor, you know, you want to make sure you wear hearing protection. Um, but low recoil, easy to manipulate, easy to shoot. The trigger on this gun is good. The sights are good. And with a little bit of time, you can really get to shooting this gun quite well. Okay. Um, there's a lot of different 22s out there, but this is the one that I always gravitate back to. I love this Smith & Wesson. It's a great gun. We've got three of them uh, collectively, and they run and run and run and run. You can run them filthy. They just work. Okay, they're great. And uh, you have an accessory rail on this if you want to run a flashlight or something. I recommend a 22 to work on the fundamentals, right? Train. Spend some time getting some trigger time in. All right, so let's say you pick up one of these M&P compacts and you get some trigger time on it and you find out, you know, wow, I really like this pistol a lot, okay? Well, guess what? You've spent all this time shooting this 22 and you've logged thousands of rounds on it and you know this gun like the back of your hand, right? You can go to the gun shop and pick yourself up a shield and that's a pretty natural transition, right? The operating, you know, parameters of the guns are pretty similar. The size of the gun is pretty similar. The frame size is pretty similar. You know, if you go with a uh, double stack shield, the Shield Plus, now this one is kind of slim because it's a single stack, but you could go from this 22 to a Shield Plus and the size and overall vibe of the gun is pretty similar. You're gonna get behind that nine millimeter and you're gonna be a lot more comfortable working on those, uh, you know, fundamentals uh, of shooting fundamentals after you've already logged a couple of thousand rounds of 22. So a lot of trainers that I have dealt with over the years that take new people out to shoot for the first time, they always start them out on a 22 for almost the whole session. That way they can really explain to them, you know, all of the fundamentals of, of how to shoot properly. Now that's not what this video is about. I wanted this to be about trying to help you pick a gun. Now I know we went over a lot of options. I guess the question you probably have in the back of your head is, well, well, out of all these options, I mean, what's what's the best? What what should I get? What works for me? I mean, what what are my needs, right? Everyone's needs are going to be different. Everyone's bodies are different. We all have different size hands. We all have different amounts of strength in our upper body. We all are different heights. Uh, you know, we, we all have different levels of experience. So all of those things are going to come into play. Don't choose a tool that's so, you know, ungainly that you can't use it properly because if you get some uncomfortable gun that you don't want to carry you're not going to carry it the most useful gun is the one you're actually going to carry that you're going to go through the effort to actually strap on and carry every single day and be an armed member of society and protect yourself and take your safety into your own hands okay um, and i think the 365 is probably one of the best options right so this is just a little Phobos, oh, I'm sorry, this is a Blackhawk holster, okay? This is a little Blackhawk paddle holster. It has this um, finger release for the, for the mechanism and the additional retention with this paddle here that you have to press in to get it out of the holster. But it's just a little basic belt loop holster. These Blackhawk holsters you can buy for, I mean, they're not expensive, right? But I, I think my argument for trying to maybe persuade you on what, what you might want to do I think the 365 and guns that are in this similar type of size range are what most people are gravitating to. The Shield Plus, the Springfield Hellcat, um, you've got the P365 and all the different variants uh, of this particular gun. There's guns like the Glock 43, the Glock uh, 42, uh, 380 and 9mm respectively, and then you've still got the old school single stack shields which all fit into this type of uh, line. Just know that these guns, want, where, whereby they are good on the capacity and they are good on the, uh, you know, they're lightweight, they're easy to carry, they hold a lot of shots, they're easy to shoot. But one thing that you might want to keep sort of in the back of your mind is that, you know, again, as we said, there is no such thing as a free lunch in physics. You know, they do 
They have a little bit of snappy recoil. You know, you do have to keep that in mind. They are going to kick a little bit because, you know, you've you got such a lightweight gun, right? So that's just something to consider. All of those factors will have to be sort of, uh, you know, weighed and considered in terms of what you might want to do. Now, there is light at the end of the tunnel, okay? If you're confused about what gun you think might work for you, the best thing you can do is find a gun range that rents guns, okay? You can go in and you can rent any gun you want. Probably most of the firearms on this table are available at, at, a, at a rental program at any decently stocked uh, range that it has a good selection of rental guns. Rent them all and try them out. All right. If you want, take an instructor with you. Take someone with you that knows guns really well and just say, hey, give me the crash course. Let me shoot XYZ. Start out on a 22. Get a couple of different 22s, different sizes, different configurations, and spend like a good hour shooting those 22s and get yourself comfortable. Have an instructor go over it with you. You can hire an instructor to go in for a couple of hours. You know, it's not a big deal. Shoot those guns. And then go through and say, hey, I want to try a 38, a 9 mil, a 45, 40, whatever you want. Go crazy. Pick out a bunch of them and just try them out. There might be that one gun that you're like, wow, man, there's just something about this one. Like, it's the sights, it's the trigger, it feels great in my hand, it points great. You know, I, I don't know why, but this one just seems like it's, it's the one for me. Look, it is completely okay to make a decision uh, on buying a, a firearm based on just that. If it makes you happy, if you put it in your hand and you like it and you shoot it well and you're comfortable with it and it's got the features you want, don't worry about anything else. Just get what you want and what makes you happy. And more importantly, get what you're actually going to carry and use. Don't buy a novelty gun, right? If this gun right here to you is a novelty because it's got a light and it's huge and, you know, this is a great pistol. But for some, you know... When you're at the gun store, you're thinking, wow, that's cool. It's got the light on it. You know, this is a, a substantial pistol. And that's cool when you're at the gun store. But when you think, all right, now are you actually going to strap this gun on your hip and carry it every single day everywhere you go? For most people, the answer is probably they're, they're going to approach this with some apprehension because it's just a large, cumbersome gun. Think about accessories, okay? You're a lady. You carry a purse, right? Think about crap you have in your purse. Do you want this big sucker floating around in your purse? No, you don't, right? A lot of people, when they're thinking about what they're going to carry every day, they prioritize things based on the level of comfort, based on the level of necessity. You want to find the perfect balance of comfort and you want to, you want to meet a necessity. And I think that something like the 365, it kind of scratches those itches because it's not so cumbersome and large, you know, that you're going to go, oh, I don't want to carry that big sucker today. But it's a level of firepower, it gives you some confidence. You're like, wow, I mean, I've got, even if I'm only carrying it with one mag, I've got 15 shots plus one in the chamber, I can get out of just about any pickle that I would find myself in going to the grocery store to go grocery shopping or to go drop off the kids or whatever. So that's kind of what the, the vein of this video was about. I wanted you to understand the sort of methodology or the, or the mindset of how we shop for guns, what you should look for in a firearm, um, and everything like that. And hopefully I answer some of those questions because uh, this is a common question that we get from a lot of people. And I know there's a lot of new gun owners out there. Some of y'all are really confused. Some folks are just buying whatever the heck they can because there for a while, availability was really spotty on a lot of stuff. So if a lot of folks wound up buying something that might not have been the right gun for them, but they bought it because they thought, well, maybe I just need to buy this so I have something. And that's, that's admirable. Right, like we, we should scratch that itch if we feel like we're in danger and we need to protect ourselves. But now that the availability on a lot of stuff has gotten a lot better, now ammo is still a little hard to get, but the guns availability have been pretty good. Most of the major firearms manufacturers are keeping up with the demand and most of your popular stuff out there that you wanna be looking at is generally pretty available right now. So don't be afraid to be picky. There's plenty of options. You don't have to buy the first thing you see. You don't have to buy the first gun you try, right? Be picky and spend your money wisely, right? There's tons of content on YouTube you can consume, right? Whether it's your favorite gun reviewers that have done videos on something, watch all the videos and just draw your own conclusions. You don't have to take the word of the first video you watch on a given gun design, right? So take your time, 
inform yourself, you know, get the information, watch the content, and learn a little bit from what all these other people are doing, and make an informed decision, and be picky, right? Because there's a ton of options, and stuff's available right now, so don't think you have to just take home the first thing you see in the counter. Like, take your time, inform yourself of the options, and make a very weighed and careful decision. And I would say, beyond that, get some dang training. Take a few classes. Um, it cannot hurt to get a little bit of training if you've never carried a gun before. It's probably something you need to look into next. Um, and, and then obviously, you gotta have a way to carry your gun, so your holster uh, complement. I hope that I, I gave you a bit of an idea of what some of the different holster options are. Um, so, you gotta be able to carry it safely, you got to be able to deploy it, manipulate it, use it safely, possess the judgment to use it in the right situations. And if all else fails, and let's say that whatever the case may be, um, that training is going to go a long way in increasing your survivability. So I'd recommend getting some training. And, uh, and look, consume all the content. You know, it, it's out here. There's a ton of information out here to help you guys learn. I wanted to make this video as a primer for folks that just are complete newbies about carry guns and hopefully um, you know we address that now are, are there some things in this video that maybe we left out that you wanted me to go over in more detail let me know in the comment section below and I'll be happy uh, to rehash any of this stuff in more detail if you want me to go down the rabbit hole on some of these concepts a little more I'll be happy to do it for you uh, we have a ton of other useful videos that we've made like this that are kind of in the 101 category. Uh, we've got videos on different, um, you know, shotgun rounds and carry rounds. And so there's tons of stuff out there that we've done uh, that is tailored for the new gun owner. So we hope that you'll consume that content. Uh, feel free to check it out. And if it'll help you, great. Uh, that's what this video is for. I want to make sure I'm helping people and doing the best uh, that I can as an experienced gun owner to try and point people in the right direction so that they can have the best tools available to protect themselves. Uh, big thank you to all of our Patreon supporters for, watch, uh, for supporting our videos. Thank you for watching today's video. Uh, if you want to support us directly, you can go over to Ballistic Inc., pick yourself up a snazzy t-shirt. Uh, that's one of the most direct ways you can support us. Um, also, uh, Patreon, if you're on Patreon and you want to throw a few bucks our way, you can certainly do that. But regardless of what you do, I appreciate you watching the video, and I appreciate folks who have supported us over the years. Many more videos on the way. Thanks for dropping by. Make sure you click that notification bell and subscribe, and that you're fully subscribed so you get all of our videos. So, uh, many more on the way. We'll see you soon.